Welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar on a post pandemic legacy, how we can build a justice system that works for everyone. Uh, this is sponsored by Thomson Reuters. Uh, my name is Nastasia Walsh. I'm the Associate Program Director for Community Health and Justice at the National Association of Counties, NACO. I'm going to be moderating today's session. Uh, just before we get started, just a reminder, the session's being recorded. Um, we will have it available on the NACO website, um, the same one that you used to register after the event. Um, typical Zoom directions. If you want to go ahead and feel free to use the chat box to pose any questions you may have throughout the panel discussion, and then we'll uh, address those during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We have a very important topic for today's discussion. I really want to highlight some lessons learned that can inform some long-term improvements to our, our justice system after the pandemic. We know that um, our counties and court systems have really become innovative by creating space for technology, usage, information and data sharing, thinking about the whole process of what a justice system looks like during the pandemic. Um, today, in today's webinar, we're going to hear from an elected county official and court leaders about how they're using some innovative practices, um, planning, technology, new systems to enhance our county's justice system and how that can help um, your communities as well. So uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, we have a great panel of speakers today. Um, to start, we have Ms. Karen Gorham, who is the Superior Court Administrator at the New Hampshire Judicial Branch. Uh, Ms. Gorham, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Nastasia. Like Nastasia said, I'm Karen Gorham. I'm the Superior Court Administrator for the state of New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, we do have a unified judicial branch, a unified court system. Uh, we have 11 Superior Courts and 30 plus circuit courts in our state. During my last five years or seven years now as the Superior Court Administrator, we've implemented electronic filing for civil and criminal cases. We've recently completed a project for electronically uh, submitting search and arrest warrants to our court. Prior to being a court administrator, uh, I spent 25 years as a county prosecutor. So I look forward to the discussions today. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. All right, so, uh, next we have the Honorable Tamara Pogue, who is a commissioner from Summit County, Colorado. Commissioner Pogue, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Thanks, Nastasia. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm a commissioner in Summit County, Colorado. Um, we are home to five world-class ski resorts. Um, and so I like to describe us as a small town with big city problems. Um, we have an annual population of about 31,000 people, but on any given night in Summit County, you'll find 75,000 people. Um, we've worked very hard in Summit and my background um, is in human services and sort of the prevention end of the spectrum. Um, and building trust in the system. So I'm excited to talk with everybody today about some of the things that we've tried up here. Great, thanks so much, Commissioner. Thanks for being here today. Uh, next, we have the Honorable Samuel A. Thuma, judge with the Arizona Court of Appeals. Judge Thuma, do you wanna introduce yourself? Thank you, Nastasia. I appreciate it. It's a delight to be here. I've been on the Court of Appeals Division One in Phoenix for about 10 years. Before that was a trial court judge on the Maricopa County Superior Court in both uh, criminal and juvenile rotations. To the extent I add any value here today, it's work that I've been a uh, part of for Arizona's Coping with COVID um, work group and task force. We'll talk about the title, which is far longer in a little bit, but um, it, the chance to work with just incredible heroes to work through the pandemic on the trial court um, perspective. Uh, and again, we'll talk about some of the feedback for that, but I'm delighted to be here and look forward to learning. Great. Thank you so much, Judge. And then last but not least, of course, is Ms. Uh, Selen Ustin, who is the Director of Partnerships and Alliances at Thomson Reuters. Ms. Ustin, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Nastasia. Um, so I am the Director of Government Partnerships and Alliances at Thomson Reuters. Um, I develop partnerships with other companies when we believe that we can jointly offer better solutions to, to our government customers. I also work with organizations uh, like NACO. I'm happy to say that we are a proud sponsor for a number of years and, um, and we're very happy to organize this uh, webinar together on a topic that we are both very passionate about. 
Um, in case, for those who are not familiar with, with Thomson Reuters and um, why we are involved in this panel, I'd like to say just a couple of words about uh, who we are, what we do, and um, what we do in, in the justice um, space. If we could go to the second slide, please. Maybe the next one. <laughs> so yes, so uh, thank you. Um, so. At Thomson Reuters, we work with uh, we work in, in a number of different um, sectors. So we are a content-driven information company, and we work with with the government, uh, from with uh, legal sector, tax and accounting, news. Um, but underneath all of it, um, our purpose is uh, to inform the way forward to a more understanding, trusting world um, for all. It is um, why we do what we do. It is what shapes our strategy. It is what, um, what motivates us. If you could go to the next um, slide, please. So um, you may not know us by name, but in your professional life, uh, you probably use one of our, our solutions. Um, if you are running a government program, you may be using Clear or Pandera to, um, to prevent and combat fraud. If you are a, an attorney, you're probably using Westlaw for, for legal research. If you're a court administrator, you may be using C-TRAC uh, court case management system. If you're a judge or, or a prosecutor, you may be relying on our case center um, solution to manage all of your evidence in a secure and, um, and streamlined fashion. So um, we operate in, in all of those areas. Uh, we work with counties, small and large, urban and rural, across the United States. And, um, and equal access to justice is an area that we are very, very um, passionate about. That's why we wanted to work with um, NACO help organize this, this webinar and talk about um, the industry perspective and how companies like us um, can help you um, offer um, better solutions to, to your constituents um, and how we can build uh, an even better justice system. So thank you very much. I'm very excited about our, our discussion today. Hey, thank you so much. And thank you for being such a great partner. We're excited to have you all here with us today and help to organize this whole great panel. So um, why don't we jump into our discussion? Um, we have a lot of interesting uh, discussion to have today. I wanna make sure we have some time for questions at the end. So um, let's just go ahead and jump in. So the first question is for you, Commissioner Pogue, um, really touching on increasing public confidence in a healthy ecosystem. So justice systems don't work in a silo. You know, they affect other systems like housing and healthcare and employment and so much more. And, and you as an elected official, you work with all of these systems. Um, can you talk a little bit about what this looks like in Summit County? How does your justice system work with all of these other systems to, to sort of promote um, a health, healthy ecosystem and community? I think this is a great question and it's one I'm really passionate about. Um, you know, when I think back to my time in human services, uh, we spent a lot of time working on prevention, right? And I think the most important element of a healthy ecosystem is one that both recognizes the impacts that things like housing have on the system, but also recognize the impacts that the system have on the ecosystem. Um, and so in Summit County, we really tried to improve public trust and confidence um, by recognizing what I would call, if we were talking about disease management, for example, the, the sort of different buckets um, that prevention can fall into. Um, so not to be too sort of geeky about this, you know, prevention can be thought of in a lot of different ways. There's upstream prevention. What is a community doing around social factors like housing, access to behavioral health care, access to education and early childhood learning? that downstream um, will uh, create a system where folks don't become involved in the criminal justice system at all. And so in Summit County, we've spent a lot of time focused on those three areas. Um, we've passed a series of mill levies that help us as government build affordable housing for our workforce. Um, it helps make sure that every child in Summit County has access to childcare, preschool, and then a quality education system. And then finally, um, as we face the sort of pandemic of behavioral health following up on the coronavirus pandemic, um, we've invested a lot of financial resources in making sure that anyone that needs um, access to behavioral health care in Summit County has an opportunity to get it. 
Um, all of those things have a huge return on investment, right? So we know that our investments in early childhood in Summit County um, save $17 uh, on the back end in terms of reductions in involvement in our criminal justice system to every $1 we invest. Um, but not always do those interventions or that sort of upstream prevention um, lead to uh, diverting folks completely out of the criminal justice system. So then the next thing we looked at is where's the nexus? Where are most folks becoming involved in the system where they don't really need to be? And the answer to that is very clear. It's behavioral health care. Um, 10 years ago in Summit County, 84% of the folks that were involved in our criminal justice system had an underlying behavioral health diagnosis. And so we've then focused in Summit County on making sure that those folks have access to the care they need in the moment when they need that care. Um, and our, if you would put up the slides for me, um, our biggest accomplishment um, in this space is our smart team. So our smart team responds to public safety calls throughout our county uh, that involve an, um, an experience, a uh, person experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Um, our team is made up of a law enforcement, a sheriff's deputy, um, a therapist, and a case manager. And all of those folks are called to respond across jurisdictions whenever the responding officer recognizes that what's happening is really a behavioral health um, crisis. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, this program has had tremendous benefit, not only to the individuals who find themselves in this situation, we in fact have a 100% diversion rate through this program, um, but it also dramatically in, uh, reduces the cost to our system, which means we can then take that money and invest it um, in different ways to further improve public confidence in our system. Um, so you can see that uh, for someone to end up in the criminal justice system uh, on average in our county has a cost of $35,000. If you go to the next slide, the total cost for someone that is about to engage in the criminal justice system with our SMART team reduces to $1,138. That is an incredible um, return uh, on our investment. And so we take that money then that we're saving and we invest it in folks um, that we can't divert out of the system, that shouldn't be diverted out of the system. And we in, uh, do it through investing in pre-child services, for example. We do it by investing in training of our law enforcement to make sure that they have all of the tools that they need to resolve a situation or a crisis in our community in a way that further um, lifts up the trust that our community can have in our judicial and law enforcement systems. Um, so for us, the real answer to that question about improving trust comes from all three of those buckets um, of prevention. Great, thank you. No, this is amazing. And I think when you can um, be transparent and show this kind of data, but then also talk about the personal stories of the people that you're impacting. I think that really does help build up that trust. So thank you for sharing sharing that example with us. Um, I'd love to turn it over to Judge Thama, um, Ms. Gorham. You know, how have you guys, um, working from sort of the court side of it, you know, what strategies have you all used to maintain public confidence and trust with the communities that you're working with? Um, you know, how, how have you been breaking down some barriers to access and working with those folks? Maybe we'll start with um, Ms. Gorham. One of the things that we've done recently in New Hampshire within the last year is we, we do have a statewide drug court in New Hampshire. And what we found was that individuals who go through the Superior Court Drug Court Treatment Program, which is typically you know, maybe 16 months to two years to three years long, depending on the individual, going back into the community from which they came without any support really just did away with a lot of things that they learned while they were participating in drug court. So we've added a community housing program onto our drug court. It, we've expanded it beyond just drug court participants, but primarily drug court, court participants, can, we, we find them housing, we pay their rent, um, while they are looking for a job, when they get a job, and then they can transition on to, into living on their own. But it has been hugely successful. In fact, so successful that the individual we hired as the leader of our community housing program got so many landlords involved in this program and they want to participate. 
we actually had to come up with a new system because our legal counsel was overwhelmed with the number of contracts being signed and our accounting department was overwhelmed with the invoicing. So we had to actually slow it down, develop a system, and now it's up and running. But the community housing program really has community members involved. We also have a Friends of the Drug Court program, which raises money for our drug courts. Um, and, and the community involvement with that population has been incredible. That's great. We know housing is so important um, when you're working with folks who have been involved in the justice system, especially folks with behavioral health conditions as well. So that's such a critical piece and such a great way to, to have your systems working together for that health, healthy ecosystem. So thank you. Judge, um, how about you? How have you been working on this? Well, and, and it, it's so hard to separate, um, you know, the last two years during the pandemic with sort of the before time. So let me focus on the last two years um, during the pandemic, and it is involved technology. Um, and, you know, how can we as a court um, and a court system keep our doors open, still administer justice, still, still decide cases um, when it's unsafe for people to be close to each other. Um, and we have, and I'll talk about some of this um, later, but we have um, used technology to do that. And I think and hope along the way, we're better serving the public. Um, we had taken some turns that were not so public service oriented. Um, that people had to wait for cattle call dockets, um, that jurors were summoned and brought in in large numbers and hopefully were used effectively, um, or at least got to a courtroom, even if they had scheduling conflicts that meant they would never serve. Well, we can, we can use technology to do better. Um, when somebody does have uh, that that scheduling issue where they're just never going to serve. Either they can defer, which is our first pre preference, um, or they can let us know electronically and not have to take time off work, sometimes at peril of losing a job without regard to how much money they may lose, a cost for the court that is saved as well. Um, we'll talk about a little bit later um, uh, appearance rates in eviction matters that we've had some real successes by, not because we intentionally thought, oh, we'll use technology to allow remote appearances, but because we had to. Uh, and my hope is we, we, we have seen too much in the pandemic to go back to the pre-pandemic days. Uh, and, and then one final point, so there's some synergies out there. Arizona is a big state. We only have 15 counties, by the way, but they're not the 36 mile by 36 mile counties I grew up with in, in Iowa when I was a boy on the farm. They're huge. And they're enormous um, broadband gaps. Um, there just are. Well, it turns out that um, one of the governor's initiatives was to try to bridge those gaps. Now, that wasn't designed to help appearance rates in courts, um, but I'm delighted to be the beneficiary of, of that if we can, uh, uh, can use those synergies and really look for opportunities, even when they may have been designed to accomplish something else. And, and so, if I may add yeah, ahead, one Tom. point to, to Judge Thummer. I think one of the, the things that we learned is that we started this these virtual hearings or accelerated these virtual hearings because of the pandemic, but we see so many other benefits. So not everybody is able to take a day off from work easily to, to get to, to the courthouse. Not everybody is able to spend a whole day in court just for to wait for a small uh, portion of their hearing. So um, we realize that with this technology, now it, there is more equal access to, 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 to the citizens. So um, I think that's why we've, we've done um, some technological advances that I think we will continue to use after the pandemic and we will see benefits uh, much longer after, after the pandemic. Absolutely. This is and this is a great transition to some of the questions that I was going to ask next. So I'm glad you um, you both teed up here because I I do think that there's been some really great innovations um, in technology, especially in the justice system and with the court system, um, just out of necessity um, and, a, and a way to do things differently that is that has moved us all far. I mean, we all know how to use Zoom now. I don't even have to you know tell people how to use Zoom anymore. Everybody knows how to use Zoom now, um, and and some of those components that I um, I don't think we're going back on some of these. So um, sort of turning into sort of that thread of it, you know, we've, we've, we've 
courts have become more innovative. You've become using these different technologies. Um, it's really sort of like changed this like paradigm um, and it's recognizing the court as, as a service and not necessarily just a building. I mean, every county has a court house, right? But um, now we're thinking about the courts a little bit differently. So Judge Thama, um, you know, carrying off what you're thinking, you know, want to think through with you, um, and you've touched on this a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about how your courts have used technology to create some of these opportunities, um, how you guys think you'll maintain some of this, and where you think maybe you're going, maybe going next. Delighted to do that. And, and um, let me start sort of in 2017, which is like prehistory for all this, right? Um, I, I chaired a task force called the Digital Evidence Task Force, right? For the state of Arizona, we issued a report that was published in Washington Law Journal on the, it, basically the concept was how about a digital evidence portal that courts could use? Um, you know, the record has modified so much since 25 years ago with respect to electronic filings and with respect to court transcripts. But when it when you talk about, you know, how you're going to get a document in evidence in court, it hasn't changed in maybe 100 years. Well, our, our thought was, why, why shouldn't it? Um, with the concept of body-worn images, you know, body-worn cameras that law enforcement was using, how come they can't get those across the threshold to the court digitally as opposed to putting them on a thumb drive or, or putting them on a CD? Well, we, we, we said, hey, we ought to be able to do that. And in the course of doing that, we stumbled onto a British company called Case Lines. Um, just by accident at the C2C in, in Salt Lake. And then our internal courts looked for a long time, did a lot of work to see how we could bring this portal concept um, to Arizona. Well, what hit next? Pandemic, right? Um, and so you have all these hearings, including evidentiary hearings that are being done remote. Um, but how do you deal with evidence? Right. Well, Case Lines then affiliated with Thomson Reuters, and now we have a pilot that uh, is well underway in Arizona to get um, what's now called Case Center, although I keep calling it Case Lines. Um, used uh, this digital evidence portal concept used statewide. What does that allow? Oh my goodness! You can do all sorts of things, uh, even in evidentiary hearings that you couldn't uh, before. But so that's one part of it, right? But just one part. Um, we then had this, this coping with COVID uh, task force. And if you could turn to that next slide, it has the full title because it's clumsy and clunky. The uh, COVID-19 continuity of core operations during a public health emergency work group, right? So that's why we call it Plan B. Plan A, you know, having left town when, when uh, that pandemic hit. Uh, and we did a bunch of stuff. It was uh, a bunch of heroes from uh, trial courts around the state, both general and limited jurisdiction um, trial courts, the front lines of, uh, of COVID, jury commissioners, court clerks, um, administrators, judicial officers. And I thought it was going to be like a tour of the morgue. Uh, because I thought it was going to be so depressing uh, that, that things were so dark for a time. Remember, we got started in April of 2020, and it wasn't. It was so delightful and creative and inventive. And you saw the miracles that trial courts were doing absolutely every day to try to keep their courts open. And the, we issued some white papers on vaccines and dealing with juries and you know how, how courts should deal with people who are symptomatic or exposed when they came to the courthouse. The, the last publication we did was looking in the future. And that was way back in June of last year when we thought Omicron wasn't gonna be a thing or we actually didn't know about Omicron. And we did some survey work. We surveyed the branch. We surveyed the Arizona's judiciary. Uh, we got about a 40% survey result um, in uh, from May. And this first bullet point is what I want folks to lo look at. This is a judicial officer. To the extent possible, we should be seeing the court as a service and not a location. And what a revelatory concept, something we had forgotten about, something that we had overlooked. Um, and isn't that really what we're, we should be doing in serving the public? Um, we have, you know, there was a comment about um, traveling to and from court. We have a county where if you live in a city in that county and are called for jury duty, you have to travel between four and four and a half hours from your home to the nearest courthouse traveling through two other states. So if you do all that to simply say, hey, I have a business trip tomorrow and I can't participate, what have you done to that, um, to that participant? Um, so we've looked at um, remote participation in a whole bunch of different con contexts because our trial court 
heroes um, were required to do that. Just yesterday, Plan B was reconvened and we issued what we hope will be our last white paper on recommendations for what types of hearings presumptively should be remote and what types of trial court hearings presumptively should be per in person in the post-pandemic world, right? Which we're not in yet. Um, I wish we were, but we weren't. Um, and there are a ton of opportunities there. Now, there are downsides without question. The digital divide, you know, it's right front and center when you do that. Um, but I'm sort of lucky because I currently chair our Access to Justice Commission in Arizona, too. It just happened that way. Um, and so I'm getting to continue to, to, to look at what we can do, how we can better serve the public in our recommendations. One slide, and then I'll be quiet if we could have that next slide. Let me show you, um, to the extent folks say uh, how you're able to appear at a court hearing doesn't matter, it, respectfully, you're wrong. Um, this is a slide and we're, we're updating and I'll get new data um, for the next 11 months uh, later on today. But in justice courts in, in Maricopa County, right, a big county, fourth largest trial court system in the country, but this is justice courts. There are 26 of them, at least one doesn't have public transportation to get there. That's where our evictions, almost all of our evictions are held. Until March of 2020, if you were um, going to be evicted for splintering detainer action and you were a tenant, you had to personally appear. No show rates varied between a third and 40%. So four out of 10 times the tenant didn't show, case was over, resolved by default. On, or in March of 2020, remote appearances were allowed and they were by phone or by Zoom, you know, any number of different ways. Look at the trends there, that bottom line. The low was uh, February uh, 2021, 14% no-shows, 14, one four. So from a high of about 40 to a low 14. Did all those tenants win? I don't know. I don't know but they had their case heard on the merits. Uh, it wasn't decided just because they couldn't take time off work or couldn't find transportation to the courthouse. And I think that's a that's an enormous step forward uh, for, uh, for access to justice. Great, thank you so much. And I, I, think, I think you're right, like the data does tell that story that we can do this. Um, that, it, that it is possible and that it is having a positive um, impact on folks and on the courts too, so that's great. Um, I'd love to hear from our, from our other panelists about how you've used um, or discussed using implementing some technology solutions to improve some efficiencies with your court. It looks like, uh, Ms. Gorham, you're ready. <laughs> you saw me unmute myself, yes. So I think, I think something I mentioned in the introductions, um, our electronic warrant process fits squarely in with Judge Thoma's first bullet point. Our, our prior process was law enforcement would sometimes have to drive two, two and a half hours to the court, take a paper search or arrest warrant with them, wait for a judge to sign it, and then go back. We heard from, you know, as a prosecutor, I heard about this all the time. You know, a two-person police department would lose an officer a street off the streets for a half a day because they needed to go to court to get a search warrant signed. COVID exacerbated that because we weren't allowing people to come into the clerk's office. So warrants would get dropped off with the bailiff. They'd make their way to a judge if a judge was available. We have a lot of one judge courthouses where a judge may not be available. And then they've got to go to another, another court to get that warrant signed. To me, we were not doing a service to law enforcement with this warrant process. So I focused on looking for um, a CEGIS compliant method to electronically submit those warrants to the courts. Local law enforcement, sheriff's departments, um, uh, um, county attorney investigators now submit all of their warrants electronically using the law enforcement enterprise portal that's run by the FBI, the agency who determines CEGIS compliance. So we're, we're safe there. No resources from our IT department were required. Um, and we were able to centralize the process. So we've now got a system where we have two warrant clerks in a central office, accepting all of the warrants, assigning them to one of three duty judges on any given day. That predictability for our judges of knowing when they may get interrupted with search warrants to sign has been an enormous, enormous help while we're trying to dig out from this backlog of cases. So the predictability, um, the process, law enforcement does not, they don't leave their desk. They submit that warrant. 
It's up to us to find the judge now to get that warrant signed. And then it's sent back to them electronically and they've got their signed arrest warrant or search warrant. That is the court as a service and not a building. And um, it's, I think it's, it's been one of my favorite projects that we've done because we've heard such great things from law enforcement and how much time it saves them so they can focus on their real job, you know, not, not just the paperwork. I think this is one area where we can also talk about um, the backlog um, because you know that there has been uh, a, a lot of backlog in, in the court system and hugely um, exacerbated because of, of, of the pandemic. Being able to use um, tools to reduce the time um, in which a person goes through the, the justice system is tremendously important. Um, as Judge Sama mentioned, we started um, our, our case center, previously Case Lines um, tool in, in the UK and in a scheme in the, in the Crown Courts of England and Wales saw a decrease of close to 50% in the number of hearings required to resolve a guilty plea, almost 50%. Um, prosecutors who use the tool um, said that they reported that they spend 80% less time preparing cases, meaning that um, they can get through more of them more quickly uh, or in the same amount of time. So um, I think that is also a um, great example of how we can use um, this technology or others um, to, um, to, to reduce the time it takes for a person to go through, through the system, reduce the backlog, um, and which in in which then affects all the, the the related systems as well, like the jails and the jail population. So um, I think it's, it's it's helpful to look at um, that angle as well. I'll just add, you know, from from my perspective as a commissioner, um, the changes that our system has made to allow people to participate remotely and. You know, some of those strategies that we're using in Summit County have already been discussed, so I won't go into the details. Some of them haven't, though, and so I've certainly made some notes. Um, but that the ability for the victims in particular to participate in these proceedings remotely um, also has significant impact, going back to that original question on improving trust in the system. I mean, think for a second about a victim of domestic violence. It feels, and it is, far safer for that person to be able to participate remotely um, in, in their due process uh, than it is for them to be able to participate in person. Um, the other thing that we've done a lot of in Summit County is what we call Sally Port advisements where our judges will actually physically come to the Sally Port before someone um, is placed in our jail, or they will do the advisement virtually from the Sally Point, Sally, where the victim, where the um, person being arrested is in the Sally Port. Um, and both of those things have helped reduce our backlog, reduce um, the number of folks that we have in our jail, um, and certainly reduce the amount of time that it takes to help somebody move through the system. And when you think about, you know, the impact on that person from a financial standpoint in terms of their ability to work or from a housing standpoint, um, those strategies are really essential. Absolutely. Um, I think I think a lot of our communities are struggling with these with these backlogs and how to make things move more efficiently um, through, you know, partnerships, through technology, um, just changing the way that we do things on a day-to-day -day basis in ways that we haven't thought about it because we've probably been doing it the same way for so long. Um, it sort of helps me sort of turn here, and I want to go back to you, Commissioner Pogue, with this question, but I um, want to hear a little bit, since you sit um, over everything and see a lot of these different agencies, can you talk a little bit about how different county agencies or county and court partnerships are working together to help um, improve some of that turnaround time. You touched on this a little bit. Um, talk a little bit about some of the par other partnerships and things that you have in Summit County. That's a great question. Um, and I, you know, with all of the changes that we've been trying to implement in Summit County, we've really created multidisciplinary teams 
to work together um, on, on the implementation. So I think one of the best examples I have of that is our pretrial services program. Um, you know, we have a judge up here who's passionate about pretrial services, um, but for the longest time just wasn't able to get to a point of implementation. And so, you know, what we did was bring together our sheriff, that judge, me as the checkbook for the program, human services, really every entity we could come up with to design a program that is, um, you know, whose sole goal it is, is to keep people out of jail, right? Because we know there are so many detrimental impacts to that incarceration. Um, and using technology, as well as that sort of multidisciplinary team, um, we're able to do that in a way that really helps protect the safety of our community. Um, so I think with any of these solutions, you know, in any conversation about reform or reducing backlog or improving public trust, having as many different partners as possible engaged in the process of designing these programs is really essential. Yeah, 100% agree. I think um, there's no one system that can do it alone, um, with, especially with so many complex needs um, of folks who are involved in the system. So that's great and great modeling. Thank you um, for sharing. So I, I'd love to open it up to everybody else. Um, can you, you guys want to share any examples from your communities about how you all have worked with uh, multi-sector partners on some of this work and helped some overcome some of that siloed thinking that we get into sometimes? Uh, Judge. Nastasha, let me um, let me approach it from a slightly different perspective, just given some kind of unique data we pulled together for Plan B. Remember, I mentioned the, the survey of the judiciary and our Plan B work group is really, you know, internally focused, just given the, the composition of it and the need for us to move quickly and to share information during the pandemic, especially the depths of it, not only that was working, um, creativity that was working, but things that didn't work, right? And at times, nobody likes to write about the thing that didn't work. Um, but at times, that is so much more valuable um, than, than knowing what did work. So, but a couple of other things we did uh, along the way as well is our State Bar of Arizona surveyed its members um, last summer. Uh, and got information back. And then we did, um, the, the administrative office of our courts did a good old fashioned random telephone survey of the public um, and asked similar questions about acceptance for technology in the courts. Um, and if you think, and, and all three cohorts, so the branch, and we're not always known for being, you know, pro change, right? Because we're based on precedent and sluggish and other things. The branch, the lawyers, and then the public at large were really all in favor of using technology um, to, to move forward um, in, the, in the future, in the post pandemic world. Um, and some of that comes from, well, it comes from a variety of different perspectives. Some of it comes from the fact that people use Amazon and Netflix, and why, if we can do that, can't we pay, you know, our fine in court um, without going down, waiting in a line and handing somebody a piece of paper. Um, but a lot of it, too, comes from other places. I know Presiding Justice of the Peace, Anna Uberman, um, for the Maricopa County Justice Courts is on this call. Her leadership on um, being forward looking for using technology um, and a whole bunch of other folks who are willing to take some risks uh, to try to better serve the public. There was one question about, you know, can we gather the information that we have published? And it, our most recent white paper, yes. Um, if you type in SMU Law Review Forum, it will take you to a website uh, at the Southern Methodist University um, where we published uh, last month, uh, not only our recommendations, but also all three surveys and all three surveys with responses. Um, and nothing was sort of uh, cleansed out of there. Thankfully, nobody used a bad word. Um, and uh, but you know, not only for the questions we asked, but the responses we got. We we wanted to be as transparent as we could be. This is an opportunity for courts to do better for an awfully long time, and I hope we don't forget that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to put that link in the in the chat. So I think someone was looking it up while you're. Um, while you were talking. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Ms. Gorham or, or, or Celine, do you guys have any anything you want to add to that? Add to those comments or um, share, you know, some of the ways that you've worked in partnership with some other community folks um, across across the board? 
Um, you know, the, the, um, I, I talked about the warrant process. We worked very closely with law enforcement before we rolled that out. They were, in, they were invested in the training they were they helped us test the program before we went live but shifting focus a little bit um, we too in new hampshire are um, piloting the case lines case center digital evidence management system directly as a result of covid and the chaos of trying to get that those exhibits like judge thuma talked about that's really what put that in the forefront for us we're fully electronically filed but evidence was still was still in paper um, so we we move forward with case lines and and we we realized that kind of with the overload of you know civil e court projects and criminal e court project we we didn't want to overload attorneys so we looked to our local bar the new hampshire bar association to assist us in coming up with a training program for case lines as we roll it out and they have been amazing partners we've never really done a joint training before but they you know, gave attorneys the CLE credits, they, they have us in their CLE catalog, um, and they've done a lot of advertising and, and promoting the, the, the new project for us. And it's been really, really an amazing partnership and one that we definitely plan on using going forward to communicate better with the attorneys in New Hampshire. Um, I'd like to add that um, we, we also see most success when um, we, when all different components of the e ecosystem can share data with each other, can talk to each other in a more seamless way. So from law enforcement to the prosecutors, to the defendants, to, to the court and the witnesses and juries, the ability to share data, uh, the ability to work with um, your existing systems, um, other third parties, um, software, making those connections is, is really important. And I think we knew this, but we saw it even more during, during the pandemic. Um, and that's part of what, what, my, what my job is. So I am looking at um, other players in, let's say the law enforcement who, who generate the, the evidence and look at how we can pull that evidence into toward, to the courts in the most seamless way. So I think that the, we will see even more and more of, of this data sharing um, across these, these different um, parties. And, um, and now it's also possible for self litigants to, um, to, to get into the system. There's more access now. Um, so if you are presenting yourself now, you can just use your phone to, to upload a document, take a picture, upload it to the system, see all the evidence um, that is in your case through a, a simple tool that you have. Um, this, is a, this is a tremendous development, I think, for, for the justice system um, and making it work for, for everyone. So uh, I think this is very exciting. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much. This just really great work happening. Um, one of the things that, I, that I'm thinking of as we as we round in this sort of this last set of some of the questions that I have and would definitely encourage our audience members to put questions in the chat. Um, if you have questions for our panelists, I know um, there's been a lot of really great um, content and information so far. Um, I'd really like to, um, to ask you, Ms. Gorham, um, and then get everybody's perspectives as well. You know, there's a lot of different things that you guys have to juggle in this work, and there's a lot of different competing priorities, um, uh, whether it's, you know, that we, we need to start this quarter, we need to implement technology, or we gonna, we need to have this partnership. There's a lot of different things and ways that we can approach this work. So, Ms. Gore, maybe you want to start. Um, how are you all thinking about, how are you prioritizing what to work on? Um, what, what, how do you even decide what, what, isn't going to get worked on right now. Um, but how are how are you prioritizing the things that are important uh, to you all? You know, I think um, right now the biggest focus is the number of pending cases everyone has on their desks, from the judges to the court staff that need cases that need processing, to the public defenders, to the private counsel prosecutors. Across the board, the caseloads are very very high. Our new cases coming in are are leveling off. But the pending cases are taking longer and longer for a variety of reasons. And we learned something very interesting. Um, you know, one of the 
one of the things that we did during COVID is, is with the Chief Justice and myself, we established an attorney working group where we had a prosecutor, a public defender, the head of the public defenders, attorney general's office, and local prosecutors. It was a relatively small group of 10 people. Um, you know, and when we began COVID, the working group was really focused on making sure we had protocols in place so we could resume jury trials. You know, the, the linchpin of our criminal justice system, jury trials, very, very important but only about 5% of our cases go to jury trial and are resolved by a jury. So that leaves the other 95% of the cases. So while we spent the first year of COVID really focusing on how can we safely conduct jury trials, um, I, I noticed we, that with the backlog of cases not getting resolved, we really needed to shift to that other 95% of the cases. That became our priority. How would we address this backlog of cases? And we learned something very interesting in our attorney working group. We were very proud of the remote hearings that will continue after COVID, the, the ability for defendants and attorneys to appear remotely. They loved that feature. But one of the attorneys during that working group said, you know, attorneys don't talk to each other anymore. They don't sit down and have time to resolve cases. So instead of just saying, okay, we're going to put another hearing on so they can talk about disposing of a case, we have dispositional hearings on every single criminal case. You've got this kind of standard case flow um, for every criminal case. Where are those off ramps that we can divert and allow for more conversation, allow for settling cases? We've got early case resolution. On the other hand, we have felony settlement conferences, which is for those large cases. It's a formal process. Both parties have to agree to, um, to go to a felony settlement conference and they have to file pleadings for the judge to review. We had nothing in between. So we decided to sort of use our felony settlement conference process and develop a criminal mediation program. At least in New Hampshire, mediation has always been used in civil cases and, and was never really discussed in criminal cases. So we developed a, um, a criminal mediation program, which was really a quick turnaround. We wanted to avoid the protocols, avoid pleadings, avoid a full day settlement conference with the parties and establish sort of a quick hitting. Um, either party can request it or the judge can request it. We've got, we asked for ARPA funds for some senior judges to come in and handle these criminal mediations. They do about 10 a day and our chief justice does them as well. One party asks for it, they get scheduled. 10 a day, um, just time to discuss that case. The victim can be present, law enforcement can be present, anybody can be present for the, the um, hearing. No memorandums are required, memorandums of law or fact. Um, it's been very, very successful. We've resolved 95% of the cases that uh, go to criminal mediation. So it's that ability for the parties to talk about that case in the dedicated time. That was one thing we did. A second thing we did is um, we, we strongly encouraged local county attorneys to have a prosecutor of the day um, where one prosecutor takes all of their cases, defense attorneys can come in and talk to them and just try to resolve those cases. The very first day we did it in uh, one of our counties, one prosecutor sat down with her cases and resolved 45 cases. It was that face-to-face -face time that they had to talk about their cases. The other thing we wanted to do is really focus on how to negotiate cases. So the judicial branch sponsored a um, an interest-based settlement presentation from an expert from Ohio. It was, an, it was a limited in-person three-hour session, but we also recorded it and we are still getting uh, requests to watch that recording. It was very, very successful. And we use interest-based negotiations in our, in our criminal mediation and our settlement conferences as well, but teaching that skill to the attorneys has been crucial and they've all appreciated it. Um, so we've really just tried to find, focus on that 95% of the cases for the backlog. We don't want to do any more major projects after we complete our rollout with case lines. We really want to focus on that backlog because that's what is going to help everybody who, who uses the court. And I'd like to add one thing since you mentioned ARPA. Um, when 
Treasury released their initial guidance. It wasn't clear if, if the ARPA funds could be used for court backlog reduction. And um, NACO uh, actually went back to the Treasury, asked for clarification, and advocated um, for those funds uh, to be, for court backlog reduction to be eligible for those funds. And, um, and Treasury did hear um, the counties, uh, did hear NACO, and um, luckily came back with updated FAQ. And then in the, in the final rule, you can see that um, the funds, uh, the backlog reduction is, is eligible for, um, for the funds. Um, and there are specific examples or more examples of um, different kinds of software that can be, um, that can be purchased with, with the funds. Initially, um, there were some provisions about you know, hiring more people, using the money for, for that. Um, but we know that that is not that doesn't solve all the problems. It's not, a, it's not always a sustainable solution. So being able to now uh, use the money for a variety of solutions, technology solutions, I think is, is a huge um, improvement and, um, and one that um, I think counties can, um, can take advantage of. I'll just add, you know, I think um, counties are respected or expected to fund an incredible variety of different things. Um, and it often, the expectations um, of what we need to fund often don't leave any room for what we'd like to fund. Um, and so for us in Summit County, we've really been very pragmatic right now because while we as a county certainly are stretched thin, there is an incredible amount of money at the state and federal level. Um, so the question that we're really asking in terms of prioritization is what programs will help us leverage other dollars that are out there? ARPA is certainly a great example of that, but there are lots of other um, you know, resources for co-responder, um, for example, that really will help us leverage our own dollars um, and expand our capacity to be able to do a lot of the things we want to do in addition to the things we have to do. And Nastasha, let me just add a, a couple more things on, because you're absolutely right on the source of funding. Um, but courts also need to be, we all need to be mindful of how to enhance efficiencies. And I don't mean cut due process corners, don't get me wrong, but there is every day that a case is pending that it shouldn't be, there's a cost. And the, the easiest cost to identify is when it's a criminal case where someone's in custody, right? When their liberty interest is is, is suspended in a juvenile case where a child's in foster care a day longer than that child should be. Those are easy to, 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 to appreciate, but that's true in civil cases as well. There's, there's an added cost. So how can we sort of better um, do our work to manage? And that um, requires a whole bunch of things, including leadership and creativity and trying new things and being strong enough to try things that don't work. Um, you know, because if all we're doing is 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 trying things that we know will succeed, I don't think we're reaching as far as we should. Um, it, courts keep enormous amounts of data. Now, exactly what we do with it, I'm not quite sure, but we, we underutilize it, I'm pretty sure. When I took over um, the Access to Justice Commission and, and looked at some things on Plan B, I realized uh, we Arizona has about 100,000 evictions every year, round numbers, right? Um, about... 91, 92, 93 percent of those are in Maricopa County, where Phoenix is, and Pima County, where Tucson is. The rest matter without question. But you know, if we focus on those two counties, we're accomplishing a great deal, um, just trying to get better. And then, as as Karen pointed um, pointed out, sometimes we forget that there are users of the courts and and frequent users. And if we don't collaborate with those, um, we're going to maybe have great ideas that are destined to fail because they don't account for limitations and needs um, for others that are frequent frequent filers, literally, uh, in the court system. So just to kind of keep that whole thing in mind. Great. Thank you all. You all jumped ahead of, of the questions I was going to ask. So um, I really appreciate that. I appreciate the comments. I know, and I especially, you know, Commissioner Pogue, you guys have so many different things that you could spend this, these American Rescue Plan Act dollars on. Um, and setting those priorities, I know, is, um, is tough. And there's a lot of things that go into those decisions. So I appreciate you. 
um, uh, sharing that perspective as well. Um, I haven't seen any questions come in on the chat, just some really great comments and appreciation for our speakers. So I'd like to um, spend the last couple of minutes um, letting you all just give um, one final, like one minute closing remarks, anything that we didn't get to that you want folks in the audience to know about or any closing remarks. So um, uh, Judge, do you wanna go first? I'm happy to, and I'll try to be brief for it, for, for a change. How about that? But um, it, our, our added reliance on technology, and I think we will see that, it's, it's been a huge digital accelerator um, for courts to change things in you know, weeks and days um, that would have taken us years and maybe decades um, otherwise. We need to also be mindful of uh, the need for, court, for technology security, for court courtroom hygiene for other things. You know, during the pandemic, the Texas judicial branch got hit by a cyber attack. So did Alaska. Um, when we rely more and more and more on technology, we got to make sure we're not a soft target for folks that want to do bad things to us uh, and to keep that in mind uh, always and everywhere. And that's not cheap and that's not easy. Thank you. Um, so I think software. what I would offer is, um, you know, we're in a, <clears throat> an incredible period of history where there is a tremendous amount of change. Um, you know, public confidence in government, for example, is at an all time low, but the expectations for government are at an all time high. And that can, I think, often for me at least, feels incredibly overwhelming. Um, so my, I think, core advice for folks would be you don't have to tackle it all in one day, you know, pick what I like to say, pick the stake closest to you and start there um, and, and then build upon your successes on that one little piece. Um, because if you do it day by day and step by step, uh, it is really amazing what you can in fact accomplish. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms. Gorham? One thing that I that wasn't mentioned today that I just wanted to talk about very quickly, you know, Judge Summa talked about um, failure to appear rates and but remote hearings and how much they help um, someone appear. We, we are very interested in looking at an online dispute resolution for that very reason. Small claims court and circuit court uh, or small claims cases in circuit court and in superior court, a lot of our collection cases um, could easily be resolved with an online dispute resolution. Secondly, the failure to appears and how much money they cost every stakeholder. They cost the judicial branch, they cost the local jails, they cost law enforcement for having to pick people up on warrants if it's a criminal case. Failure to appears cost a lot of money. In addition to the remote hearings, um, we are going, we about to do this right before COVID hit, but we put the project on hold, but a text message reminder program for people to come to court have proven hugely successful. We piloted it in our uh, family mediation cases and it increased participation by 40%. Um, I think we're at the point now where we can tailor the text message to you have a remote hearing at this time or you need to be in court at this time. And we're really looking forward to seeing how that will help improve failure to appear rates, which helps every stakeholder involved in the judicial system. Absolutely. Thank you. I mean, think about how many times your doctor or your dentist calls you when you have an appointment. I mean, they just like bury you with calls and text messages and emails. So same, same idea. Thank you. So Lynn, uh, final comments. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that we're really, um, it, we're very proud to work with, with counties. Um, we, we, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your problems, your uh, issues, your priorities. We want to work with you. Um, we just want you to know that you know industry is here to um, offer you you some some solutions. We're happy to work with your systems, with other systems, um, to make sure that we can jointly provide you with with tools and systems that that help you better address your your constituents' problems. So um, we're um, we're looking for. We really are happy to to work with with the counties and uh, also thank NACO for um, for facilitating that the communication with with the counties. So thank you very much. Great, thank you all so much. Thank you so much for the partnership. Um, really great discussion today. 
really great takeaways. As I, as we mentioned at the very top of the hour, um, we are recording this. It's going to be posted on the NACO website. Um, so folks can, can take a look at those later. We'll share the slides as well, post those online. Um, some great data points there for folks. So thank you again to all of our panelists. Thank you for Thompson Reuters for the, the uh, partnership and everybody have a safe and great rest of your week.